Hi, I'm Ray Dillon. Today we're going to talk about how to set up a short track asphalt car. By short track asphalt car, I'm speaking of from the quarter mile bullpen up to say a mile track such as Milwaukee. The cars that we're using in our examples today are both ASA perimeter frame cars. Now your rules for your particular racetrack will possibly vary a little bit as far as tread width, overall weight, or body aerodynamics. But the basic procedure to go through for the setup is going to remain the same. Your particular numbers will possibly be a little bit different. The first thing that we're going to do, if you want to take your sheet and follow along, item number one says the race car must be 100% race ready. In other words, we want the car to be full of fuel, all the liquids in it, the size tires that we're going to race. In other words, completely ready to go to the racetrack, we need to make sure at this point that all the weight is in the car. We're going to set the tire stagger at this time at an inch and a half in the front and an inch in the rear. By tire stagger, I'm talking about the difference in the circumference of the right side tires to the left side tires. Simple way of measuring that is just take a tape measure and measure around the tire. If you lay the tire down on the floor flat, with the appropriate air pressure in, like you're planning on running, put your tape measure around the middle of the tire, and it'll tell you what the circumference of the tire is. So at this time, we want to stagger our tires so that the right front is an inch and a half larger in circumference than the left front, and we want the right rear an inch bigger than the left rear. Before you mount and size your tires, make sure you have the right offset wheels on the race car. By offset, I'm talking about backspacing. To measure that, lay the empty wheel on the floor with the valve stem hole pointed up, measure from the floor to the back side of the center, and however many inches that is, is what we refer to as the offset. On an ASA car, we run a five and a half on the left and a four and a quarter on the right. If you don't have a tread width rule, you can run a narrower offset on the right side. In other words, if you can run, say, a 65 inch tread width, you'll want to run a three inch offset wheel on the right with the five and a half on the left. Next thing we need to do is put the car on scales. Now you can use farm scales, grain platform type scales, or there are some good electronic scales on the market. What we're going to use today and what I normally use is a long acre computer scale. We have a little brain box here which records the weights and each scale that sets under the wheels is a load cell. First thing we need to do is calibrate the scales and make sure that they're at zero. What we're going to do is put a known weight commodity on a scale and weigh it, read the rating, and we're going to make sure that that scale is properly zeroed. Okay? Now the next thing we're going to do is set the car on the scales and get a total weight. Now after the car is on the scales, you need to walk around to all four corners and bounce the car to make sure that the shock absorbers aren't holding the car up and not letting the spring set all the way down. If you have a conventional spring car, by that I mean without coilovers, I suggest at this time you disconnect your shock absorbers so they're not having a tendency to hold the car up off from ride height. Okay, if you'll notice with the Long Acre electric scales, I've made a little set of stands to put them on. The reason that I've done this is so that the car's up high enough in the air when I'm ready to get underneath the car and level out the trailing arms, there's enough room that I can slide underneath the car on a creeper. After carefully calibrating the scales, making sure we have the right offset wheel and setting the stagger, we place the car on the scales. Now we need to check our ride heights. Every car manufacturer can provide you with a set of specifications as to the design ride height of the car, whether this be A-frame angles or actual measurements from the ground to a certain point on the frame. Next thing we're going to do before we finally weigh the car is we're going to make sure that we've got it setting at its designed ride height. Before setting the ride heights on the car or weighing the car, be sure you come up to the front 
and disconnect the front stabilizer bar so that it doesn't have an effect of cross weight in the car. Just completely unhook it or back it off to the point where there's no preload on it. To set ride heights on the front of a car, I like to use a protractor, a little magnetic base protractor that will measure the angle of the upper A-frames. The ride height specifications on the car we're working on right now call for an 18 degree angle on the right upper A-frame and 28 degrees on the left. You simply place the protractor on top of the A-frame and read the angle and adjust the spring height accordingly to to vary the chassis ride height until you achieve the proper angle on the A-frames. To set the ride heights on the rear of the car, the way I do it is with a level on the lower trailing arms. When this car is at the proper ride height in the rear, both the lower trailing arms will be level. It's also a good idea at this time while you're under the car, check your rear end alignment. By rear end alignment, I mean the wheelbase, the way the rear end is squared in the car. Your car manufacturer can supply you with some specifications as to where the rear axle tube should be located front to rear, as well as an adjustment procedure for the pannard bar to make sure that the rear end is located laterally in the car where it belongs. This is all very important to make sure the rear axle is where it belongs as we're doing the setup. After weighing the car, now we're going to write the individual wheel weights down and do it from a top view. Pretend you were in an airplane flying over the top of the car, going the same direction as the car, looking down at the scales. Okay, our individual wheel weights are 650 pounds on the left front, 625 on the left rear, 700 on the right front, and 525 on the right rear. I always put an X in the middle just to keep things from getting confused. Next thing we do is take our little pocket calculator or another handy tool is the little Schoenfeld calculator which is already pre-programmed on the back of the computer is a list of the different functions that it will do for you. For ease of explanation, we're just going to assume we're using a pocket calculator at the present time. So what I want you to do is add all four of these weights together and then we're going to write the total weight at the top. This car weighs 2,500 pounds. The next thing that we want to know is what is our left side percentage? To figure a left side percentage, take the left front and the left rear, add them together, divide by the total. That'll come out at 54%. I write that on the left side because it's left side weight. Next thing we want to know is the rear percentage, so we add the 625 to the 525. Take the answer, divide it by the 2,500 pound total. Your answer is the percentage of rear weight, which is 49. The reason we want to know these percentages at this time, we're going to have to put some weight in the car because the rules call for the car to weigh 2,900 pounds. Weighs 25, so we know we've got to put 400 pounds of weight in the car. Our left side weight rule is 56%, so we know we can stand a little more left side weight. We want 50 and a half on the rear for our initial setup. So we're going to take our 400 pounds of weight, put it in the car at this time, and then we'll reweigh it. Some track rules require the car to be weighed with the driver, where other sanctioning bodies weigh only the race car. At this time, let's determine which category you fall into. As we're putting our ballast in the car and determining our left side weight, it's important whether your rules require the driver in or out of the car. So whatever the case may be, we're going to go ahead and weigh the car under your circumstances at this time and determine the total amount of ballast that we're going to put in the race car. Okay, after we've put our 400 pounds of ballast in the car, we're going to weigh it again, write the numbers down, figure the percentages again, just like we did. Okay, our weights this time are 740 on the left front, 710 on the right front, 826 on the left rear, and 624 on the right rear. Let me redo that a little bit. 
Okay, we'll do the same thing again. We add all four weights up together and write the, or the total weight at the top. Add the left two together, divide your answer by the total weight, and find your left percentage is 54. Now remember, we were shooting for 56. This tells us that we got our ballast in the car too far to the right. So we're going to need to move it over to the left a little bit to achieve 56%. Let's go ahead and figure the rear, 826 plus the 624. Add them together, divide your answer by the total, and find that we've got 50% on the rear. What this is telling us, our total weight is right. We got the right amount of ballast in the car, but we didn't properly get it located. We've got it too far forward because we wanted 50.5 on the rear. We have it too far to the right because we wanted 56 on the left. This time I want to stress that you need to understand we're not going to go start turning screws on the car. The only way that you're going to change rear weight percentage or left side weight percentage is by physically moving something in the car. So to get these numbers right, we're going to go back to the car and move our ballast to the left and a little bit to the rear. The way I like to put the ballast in a race car is to find a piece of steel tubing that is of a size that will fit inside your frame rail. It just so happens that what we're using is two and a half by three and a half, and it's a foot long. This piece will weigh just about 50 pounds. You weld a cap on one end, melt lead and pour it in until it's full. Then you need to also put a little cap across the end, weld it on so the lead can't dislodge itself and slide out of the tube. We take this and slide it in the main rail. The nice feature of doing it this way is if you need to change your front to rear balance, you can loosen the jam nuts, which are wedging the lead in the rail, and you can take a broom handle and slide the ballast fore or aft to change your rear weight, tighten up another screw, and you're done. And with it sliding in your main rail, this doesn't change your left side percentage. It only changes the front to, front to rear weight distribution. Now after reweighing the car again, we're going to figure the percentages. Our numbers are 783 on the left front, 841 on the left rear, 667 on the right front, 609 on the right rear. Again, we add them all together to get the total weight, just to make sure we've not made a mistake on the scales, and we're going to write that at the top. Take the left two, add them together, divide it by the total. That'll give you a weight percentage. OK? We did good. We're shooting for 56%. We had 54. So by moving the weight to the left, we increased the left side percentage. Now let's check the rear. We add the left rear and the right rear together. Divide the answer by the total weight. Comes out 50. OK, we're close, but we're not quite right yet. We've got our left percentage right but we want another half percent of rear. So at this time, we're going to move the weight one more time, but we're not going to move it from left to right in the car. We're only going to move it to the rear because our left percentage is where we want. All we want to do is increase the rear. Now that we have all the ballast located in the race car, let's make sure that we have got it as low as we possibly can get it. And Keep in mind when you're locating this ballast to keep it as close to the center of the car as you can. There is a theory called polar moment of inertia, which is a very simple formula that the closer the mass of the weight is to the center of the car, the easier the car is going to turn and it will have less reaction to this weight shifting as you go around the corner. Let's figure the percentages one more time and see how we did. 776 on the left front, 659 on the right front, 848 on the left rear, and 617 on the right rear. Let's add them together, come up with a total weight of 2,900 pounds. Take the left front and the left rear, add them together, divide by the total, 56%. That didn't change because we didn't move the ballast from right to left. We only moved it to the rear. Now let's figure the rear. 848 plus 617 
divided by 2,900 pounds, 50.5. Now we have the total weight, the left percentage, and the rear percentage. At this point, we're going to go ahead and tie the lead in the car by bolting it down, or hopefully it's installed in the frame rail and bolted in. When you're putting the ballast in the car, always keep in mind, keep it as low as you can and attempt to keep it located between the center line of the rear tires and the center line of the front tires. In other words, between the axles. We want to keep it as low as we can and in the middle of the car. So now our numbers are right. We're going to go ahead and tie the lead down. Then the next step we're going to do is figure the diagonal weight. After we have finally determined that we have the correct total weight, the correct left side percentage, the correct rear percentage, and we have the lead as low as possible in the car, we're going to go ahead and bolt it in, and we're not going to move the lead anymore. The rest of our adjustments are going to be done by turning the screws. What we're after now is wedge or diagonal weight. From this point on, we will not use the driver in the car anymore. Our formula on diagonal weight percentage equaling left side weight percentage is assuming that there is no driver in the car. So from this point on, keep in mind we're not going to use the driver in the car as we adjust the wedge or for the remainder of our setup. By diagonal weight, we're speaking of the wedge or the bite. Depends on what part of the country you're from, it's called different things. Essentially what it amounts to, it is the percentage of weight of the total weight of the car that is carried by the left rear and the right front. To figure this, we take the left rear, add it to the right front, take our answer, divide it by the total weight. Okay, let's do it. 848 plus 659 divided by 2,900 pounds, we come up with 52%. Our start out setup is going to call for left side weight to match the diagonal weight. This is just a good rule of thumb. If your rules call for a car at 56% left, 56% diagonal will normally work as a starting point. If you're at 60% left side weight rule, you want to run 60% diagonal. We've got 52%, we want 56%, so what we're going to have to do is get the left rear and the right front to weigh more while the left front and the right rear weigh less. Now is when we start turning the screws on the car. In order to make these wheels weigh more, we're going to tighten the spring. Whether it's a conventional spring or a coilover or a torsion bar, it doesn't matter. We're just going to make that spring tension tighter on that wheel to make it weigh more. We're going to go all the way around the car to try to keep our ride heights maintained. We're going to tighten the right front and the left rear we're going to loosen the left front and the, le and the right rear at the same time to maintain our ride heights. Okay, let's weigh the wedge and see how we did. 717 on the left front, 907 on the left rear, 717 on the right front, and 559 on the right rear. Every time you reweigh the car, add all four together. Don't assume your total weight because you may be off a pound or two on your scales and this will throw the percentage off. So let's add them all four up again. We'll write our total at the top. Just to make sure that we've not missed anything, let's figure the left again. 717 plus 907 divided by 2900 is 56. Okay. Now, all four weights have changed on the car, but the left side weight didn't change. The reason it didn't change, because this time we turned the screws, we didn't move any weight. The most important thing that you can understand from this tape is to, to move your left percentage. That is only, only going to happen by physically moving weight in the car. The only way you're going to change left side or rear is by moving weight. You change wedge by turning the screws. Okay, let's figure our rear again. Add the two rears together, divided by the total, 50.5. That hasn't changed. Now add the left rear and the right front, divide the answer by the total, 
and that will be 56%. It matches the, the left side weight, which is what we're after. The next thing we're going to talk about is caster and camber. Caster is the relationship of the upper ball joint to the, rear, to the lower one as far as being from front to rear location. Think of a bicycle. The fork in a bicycle angles forward, and this gives you directional stability. This is what you call positive caster. Camber is the inward or outward tilt of the top of the tire. On the right front, the top of the tire is leaned in toward the carburetor because we're going to be turning left and the car will be rolling right. This is what you call negative camber in at the top. Also on the right front, we run positive caster, which means the top ball joint is back in relation to the bottom ball joint. We use a gauge to set this, and you need to turn your gauge over on the back side and read the instructions because some caster gauges, you turn the front of the wheel out 20 degrees to zero the gauge, other gauges, you turn it in 20 degrees to zero the gauge. So be sure you're starting out the wrong way or your caster readings will be backwards. We put it on the end of the spindle, and you can read the camber directly right next to the bubble that says camber. We're shooting for three and a half degrees of negative camber on this wheel. Now to check the caster, we turn the wheel out or toward me at the front 20 degrees which on this car is one turn of the steering wheel. We zero the gauge. There's a little button on the bottom side. You zero it. Now we turn the steering wheel two revolutions to the left, which would be 20 degrees in. Level the gauge back up, and you can read the caster setting. And we want one and a half degrees of positive caster on the right front wheel. When you get to the left side of the car, you have to have different alignment specifications for the inner wheel. On the right front, we're looking for a caster setting of one and one half degrees positive, which means the top ball joint is back, and a camber of three and one half degrees negative, which means the top of the tire is tilted inward. If you were sitting in the driver's seat looking at the right front tire, this is exaggerated. It's leaning in at the top. The left front will be leaning out at the top, and that will be positive camber on that side, and we're going to set the caster negative. In other words, the top ball joint is going to be lead on the left front, and those figures on the left front on caster are one half degree negative and on our camber on the left front we're going to initially set it one and one half degrees positive which means the top of the wheel is tilted out. The next thing we're going to do is set the toe in. We've come up with a rather simple and unique way of uh, measuring the toe end. What we have here is a, a pair of boards that we put up against the outside of the sidewall of the tire. It's a rather unique board. It's a honeycomb piece of aluminum. And I prefer it uh, as opposed to a piece of shelving board because moisture or temperature never causes this board to warp. The way this works, it takes two people. We put a board up against the sidewall of the tire on each side of the car. We take a pair of identical tape measures and slide them underneath the car and you'll notice the board has a little slot cut in it about two inches up from the ground. Slide the tape across. Now this takes a smart guy and a dumb guy to do this. That's, that's the dumb end of the tape over there that Rich has. I got the smart end today. Slide the tapes across, hook them, and put your knee just gently in the middle of the board to make sure it's firmly up against the sidewall of the tire. Stretch your tapes out, and you read the difference between the front measurement and the rear measurement, and that tells you whether the car is towed in or towed out. On a short track pavement car, we like to start the initial tow 
in an out position, we tow it out a sixteenth of an inch. And incidentally, these boards are available for sale from Dillon Enterprises in North Liberty, Indiana. The next thing we're going to look at is bump steer. What bump steer means is how the tow changes on an individual wheel as it's going up and down. We're going to check the bump steer on the right front. To do this, first we need to disconnect the spring and the shock absorber, get them out of the way. We have a jack underneath here, placed underneath the lower ball joint, and we've jacked this suspension up to ride height. Remember earlier today, we set ride heights by an angle with a protractor on the upper A-frame. Jack your suspension back up to ride height. And we have a plate bolted to the hub with a dial indicator on each side. Now these dial indicators really need to have at least a minimum of one inch of travel available. So we center the indicator, have the suspension at ride height. Now we're going to zero the indicators on each side. We have a little yardstick attached to this piece of plate here. We're going to go up exactly one inch with the suspension. and We're going to watch the dial indicators. Now what we're after is a tow out condition, which means if both of these are going away from us as the A-frame arcs toward the carburetor, the net result that we want to end up with is that the rear of the wheel has gone away from us more than the front. The net result is a tow out situation. For example, if the front indicator goes in 200 thousandths and the rear one goes in 230 thousandths, this tells you that you have 30 thousandths of an inch of tow out in an inch of bump. If that's not the situation, you need to change the shim on the end of the tie rod. Shim the outer tie rod either up or down. On a front steer car, to increase the tow out in bump, you shim the tie rod end down. If this isn't practical, if you have conventional type steering, by that I mean a steering box with an idler arm and a center link, you can possibly bend the pitman arm and the idler arm to raise the inner pivot points. What you need to understand is to increase the bump out condition is you either lower the outer end of the tie rod or you raise the inner end of the tie rod. What we try to shoot for on our short track cars, we want the right front to tow out 30 to 35 thousandths, and we want the left front to be somewhere in the situation of zero to 10 thousandths out. And you do all this with the chassis setting level, suspension removed, checking one wheel at a time. The last pre-race adjustment that we need to make on the car is to preload the stabilizer bar. At this time, hook the stabilizer bar back up and adjust it to neutral. Now we want to preload it one turn of the adjustment. By preload, what I mean is it should be trying to pick up on the left front tire and pull down on the right front tire. This is what we call one turn of preload. Now we're ready to go to the racetrack. And the last thing we need to do before we go is double check all the lead and make sure it's properly secured, make sure all your bolts are tight and everything is wired down that needs to be so something's not going to fly off the car when you get to the racetrack. Now you get to the racetrack and you go out and make your hot lap session. If the car's not handling exactly right, we're going to talk about, let's assume that the car is loose. Okay, all these adjustments I'm going to talk about are to adjust a car that's loose. If your car is pushing, you just make an adjustment in the opposite direction. First thing we want to do is to start with the tire stagger. Remember when we scaled the car, we had an inch and a half stagger in the front and one inch in the rear. For most tracks, you'll want to start the opposite way. Remember we scaled the car so that the front tires weighed the same and you know that a difference in stagger affects the wedge of the car. Well, we like to use an inch and a half in the front and one inch in the rear for the initial setup because that way with the front tires weighing equal, it's a pretty good starting point. So I'd suggest before you ever get to the racetrack, switch the front tires to the rear and the rear to the front so we've got an inch and a half rear and an inch front. Now, back to if the car is loose once you get to the racetrack, in order to correct that with tire stagger, you can either close up the rear, in other words, switch them back like we had it when we scaled it, or you can open up the front. Either one will help cure a loose condition. If this doesn't help or it helps a little and you need to go some more, the next thing, item number two on racetrack adjustments, is the sway bar. 
Let's put another turn of preload in the bar. This will help tighten the car up because it reduces front roll. The third thing that we would do would be add some wedge. And remember earlier when we were setting the car up, trying to keep the car setting level, if you're going to add wedge, don't just run up to the right front and crank a bunch in it. Put a little in the right front, take a little out of the left front, put a little in the left rear, and take a little out of the right rear. This will help keep the car setting at the designed ride height. Now, if all this fails, the last thing that we want to do is dive into changing springs and shocks. Let's start with some initial recommendations for springs and shocks. Now, first I'll talk about a coilover car, and then I'll give you some recommendations right after that on a conventional spring car. Let's say we're going to start out with our coilover car. On the left front, we're going to have a 350-pound spring, and on the right front, we're going to have a 400. On the left rear, we're going to have a 200, and the right rear will have a 150. Now remember, we're talking about if the car's loose, what are we going to do? Well, to tighten the car up, the choices that you've got is you can increase the rate on the left rear, increase the rate on the right front, or you can decrease the rate on the right rear, or decrease the rate on the left front. You can do a little bit all the way around, or you can do just one at a time. For example, if this car was loose, probably the first thing I would do would be take the 200 out and I'd put a 225 in the left rear. This not only increases the amount of spring on the left rear, it changes the split in the springs. The next thing that I would do would be increase the right front. Let's say go to a 425. Same thing. It increases the total front spring in the car, plus it increases the right front, plus it increases the split between the two of them. Now, if you have conventional springs, we're going to start out, now keep in mind the rates will be quite different on a conventional spring because it's not placed as close to the wheel, so the motion ratio is different. We're going to start out with a 900 in the left front, a 1200 in the right front, a 250 in the left rear, and a 200 in the right rear. Now, if this situation turns to be loose and you want to tighten this car up, you've got the same choices. You can increase the rate in the left rear or the right front, or decrease the rate in the right rear, or decrease the rate in the left front. For example, what I would probably do here would be to get rid of the 200 and go to a 175 in the right rear. If you still need more, you can go to the left front and decrease it from a 900 to an 800. Same theory applies. We're having more split between the front springs or the rear springs. Either situation will tend to help tighten the car up. Now keep in mind all of these recommendations that I'm giving you here apply to the two type cars that we're working with today. You need to check with your chassis builder and get his recommendations, not only for the left side percentage or the rear percentage, the front end alignment, and the initial spring and shock setup. Now, the only thing we haven't talked about so far is shock absorbers. And using a numbering system like Carrera uses, the next to last number and the last number are the only numbers that I'm going to talk about. We're going to start out with a pair of 95s on the rear. What this means, a 9 tells you it's a 9-inch stroke, and the last number tells you the rate of the shock, in other words, how stiff it is. We're going to have a 77 on the right front and a 76 on the left front. What that means is these are both 7-inch stroke shocks as opposed to 9s, and the 5s are soft, 6 is a medium, and a 7 is a heavier one. The numbering system ranges everywhere from, I think it starts at 4 and goes all the way up to 10, like for a right front at Daytona. Well, for most short track applications, the 95s on the rear pretty well do the job. If you're running a little bit heavier weight than an ASA car, good possibility that your left rear will need a 96 on it. If you're on an easy track, by that I mean not real rough, you can sometimes run a pair of 76s on the front. If you get to a higher bank rough track, 
There's not too many of them in the country, like Bristol, Tennessee, or Winchester, Indiana. You'll want a pair of 78s on the front, and a pair as much as a 97 on the rear, and a 96 on the right rear. But that's an extreme situation. For all practical purposes, if you stick with 95s on the rear, and 76s or 77s on the front, you're gonna be in the ballpark. I'd like to give you some tips at this time on selecting the tires for your race car. Instead of going to the tire truck and just getting four tires that are round and black, we know that we want our right side tires to be bigger than the left side tires. So what we're going to do is go sort through the tires that are available, and we're going to measure a brand new tire around the middle and get the circumference of it just for comparison purposes. Basically, if you've got a pair of tires, one being for the left side and one for the right, and you have a quarter of an inch difference in circumference, you will end up with an inch of stagger with the 10 pounds difference in inflation pressure, assuming that our cold starting pressure is going to be 26 pounds on the right, 16 pounds on the left. After you've selected the four tires that you're going to use, mount them up and check with your manufacturer or look on the sidewall of the tire and see what their recommended maximum inflation pressure is. For safety circumstances, never exceed that. Take the right side tires, blow them to 60 pounds. Let them set for a minute or two, and then immediately let them down to 36 pounds. If you'll measure the circumference of that tire at that time, that's going to tell you how big that tire is going to be after you come off the racetrack, assuming you started at 26 pounds and it picked up 10 pounds of air. On the left side tires, inflate them to 50 pounds, let them down to 20, and measure them, and it will give you the same guideline for your left side tire. Last thing we need to talk about today is tire temperatures. This is something that's a very useful tool in determining how your car is actually handling. Possibly your driver is not real sure if it's pushing or loose. He just knows he's not going fast enough. Well, let's take some tire temperatures to, to help us analyze what's really happening with the car. Let's say that uh, to start with, let's take a look and see if we've got the right camber. Let's look at the right front and say the outside of the tire is 200 degrees, the middle is 225, and the inside is 250 degrees. Now the car's going this direction, so this is the outside of the tire, this is the inside. Okay, we've got a 50 degree split. That tells us that we've got too much camber. In other words, the top of the tire is tilted this way too far. So let's try taking a half or three quarter degree camber out of the car, go back out, run again, and what we're looking for is about a 15 degree spread. I like to see the inside of the tire about 15 degrees warmer than the outside of the tire. This gives us a pretty, indi pretty good indication that we've got the right camber established. Something else that we want to look at, let's say that the average temperature of our right front tire is 200 degrees, and the average temperature of our rear tire is 250 degrees. This is on the right side, right front, right rear. 50 degrees hotter tells us that this car is loose. In other words, it needs more wedge, it needs less stagger in the rear, it needs stiffer front springs, particularly right front, possibly a stiffer left rear. Now let's say our left side tire temperature is uh, Oh, let's say the left front is only 125 and the left rear is 200 degrees. Well, see, we've got an, a, another indication right here that the car is running loose. Now, comparing left side temperatures to right side temperatures is really a waste of time because that's going to vary from track to track. It's going to depend on the size of the racetrack and the banking of the racetrack. So what I try to compare is front to rear and primarily on the right-hand side of the car. The different uh, specifications that we have talked about today as far as how to set the caster and camber, the particular alignment that we use, the different spring recommendations that I've talked about, you need to keep in mind that these recommendations apply to the two different cars that we were working on today. You need to get the specifications for your particular car from the person who built the car. The basic theories of how to figure weight balance and how to shove weight from front to rear 
apply to anything, but the particular numbers for your car need to be applied to your car. It's been a pleasure talking with you this afternoon. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have good luck, and I'll see you at the races.